Yeah, Susan and I had been away for a couple of weeks there, and it was a, uh, some folks is asking, you know, um, it was a fantastic time for us. Rarely have we ever been away just by ourselves. And we had a little family there for a couple of days, but, but then it was just us, and uh, a young lady had, and her husband had opened up the door for us to go to Nantucket for a couple of weeks, and all before they closed their house up for the winter. And I think there's usually around 40,000 people there, but after uh, Washington's Day, Columbia. Columbia, yeah, one of those important people. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, it was some day, it was special, but there's like six or 7,000 people there. So there's not a soul. There are seals on the beach, but no souls out there. And so if we'd get up at, you know, quarter after five, you know, walk down the beaches just to pray and see God. The stars were amazing. There's not a lot of light pollution, you know, way out there. And uh, the shooting stars were amazing. I don't know if you ever did this. I didn't tell the other services. You're special right here, okay? <laughs> but when I was a teenager, we'd get together with a bunch of teens, and we lived on a farm. We'd go out in the field with one pillar and have like 15 people all put their head on that one pillar, okay? <laughs> you look like a wagon wheel at night. And after around 12.30 or 1, something like that, uh, we'd be camping out anyhow, but you would just all look there and kind of get that peripheral vision mode on, and the amount of shooting stars you'd see was amazing, you know? And you're right close to other people, and you're talking, oh, did you see that one over there? But we did that while we were there, you know? And uh, it was just, it was fantastic. But the most important thing, we went just to, to pray and seek God, and we got to read a bunch of books that been kind of on our list and kind of, you know, uh, get some real good coaching for where we're going as a church in the, uh, the, the, the years ahead. Because the bottom line is to reach as many men and women, boys and girls, for Christ as we possibly can. And one of the things come to the conclusion of is that in the, the year ahead of uh, Faith Living Church, we're going we're gonna to grow, I believe, by hundreds, but it's going to be simpler than it ever was before. You know the gospel is simple? You know, religion becomes very complex and complicated, but sharing the gospel and growing in our relationship with him is real, real simple. So um, I wanted to make an announcement today that we only have two months. You only have two months left. Now you're going, what are you talking about? You're getting kind of weird on us here. You only got two months left. Did you know that? Two months left of this decade, and we're going to launch out into 2020, a whole new decade, you know? What are you going to do in the new decade that is ahead of us? It's good that we can stop and think about it, talk it about it right now. How are you going to spend your time, energy, and resources in the decade that is ahead of us to really make a difference with your life? Just something to think about. And also, how many of you enjoyed the extra hour of sleep you had this morning? Somebody said, extra hour? Huh? What? <laughs> I know. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I didn't, I didn't really get an extra hour either. I stayed up too late, you know, like somebody else had told me they had did. I said, like, I didn't get the extra hour. I just I knew it was coming, so I stayed up later. But uh, <laughs> and it kind of offset each other there. But uh, what I want to talk about, we've been talking about the path, and I want to thank uh, Dan and Sue for sharing the services while we were away. They did a great job. Uh, but we've been talking about the path. Yes, absolutely. But as we're talking, of continuing on this theme about the path, you know, walk with me. I want you to hear those words as Jesus is beckoning you to walk with him. And that's basically what we did while we were away. We hung out with God, you know, 5, 15, 5.30, to walk down the beaches where there's not a living soul. There's a bunch of seals, but there wasn't no human people out there. And just to spend time with God. And, and I want you to understand something. This is real what I'm talking about. When I'm talking about walking with God, it's real. God lets you in on secrets. He gets you, 
you, on the cutting edge of things. He helps us and answers our prayers and gives us insight when you spend real genuine time, you know, sacrificial time with Almighty God. And I want to talk about this concept just a little bit. Uh, one of the things you're going to see when you read your Bible is that God is just absolutely amazing. And these passages I'm going to read to you are just like, if we'll chew on every verse, it's like, whoa, there's just a lot of good in there. And uh, it says here in Psalms 145, verse 1, it says, I will praise you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Why would someone say, I'm going to bless you forever and ever? That someone must have done something spectacular that you're going to bless him forever and ever, you know. And just in case we didn't get that, he just continues on in verse 2. I will bless you every day and I will praise you forever. And then he goes on to say in verse 3, great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. His greatness is, is beyond discovery. And you think, what does that mean? His greatness is beyond discovery. It really means it's immeasurable. You know, if you don't have a tape measure long enough to measure how awesome and wonderful and how tall and deep and wide God's greatness is. It's beyond the ability to measure. It's beyond discovery. It's beyond any measuring device we have here on this planet. And that's what he says here. His greatness is beyond discovery. Verse 4 says, let each generation, we are in a generation, are we not? Let each generation tell its children of your mighty acts. Let us tell our children, our grandchildren, the children in our communities, let us tell them of God's mighty acts, what he's done in our lives. You know, in our time, what we have seen and experienced of God's mighty acts. So he tells us that in verse 4, let each generation tell his children of your mighty acts. And then he says, I will meditate. I'm going to ruminate. I'm going to chew on this a little bit. He says, I will meditate on your majestic, glorious splendor and your wonderful miracles. Think about the wonderful miracles that God does in our lives. Sometimes we think, well, that's just a little insignificant thing. There's some little insignificant things that are life-changing, are they not? And we need to think about those things that God does for us, has done for us, and we need to think about them and chew on those things. And then he says in verse 6, your awe-inspiring deeds will be on every tongue. Everybody's going to be talking about it. And I will proclaim your greatness that is immeasurable, that is beyond discovery. It's just so good you can't measure it. Verse 7 says, everyone will share the story of your wonderful goodness. Everyone. It's just happening all around us because God's goodness is to us all. They will sing with joy of your righteousness. The Lord is kind and merciful. He's slow to get angry. Aren't you glad he's slow to get angry? Does anybody here know someone who's quick to get angry? Don't look in their direction or nothing right now, okay? People who's quick, it's like, oh, boom, you know, they got a short fuse. You know what I'm saying? Boom. Well, God don't have no short fuse at all. The Lord is kind. He's merciful, and he's slow to get angry, and he's full of unfailing love. Let me see if I got this put back in my bag. Oh, yeah. Okay, it's there. So make sure I can draw, you know, real quick. I need to. All right. He says here in the next verse, the Lord is good to who? Everyone. What percentage is everyone? Is anybody who you would think would not be in that category? That God wouldn't be good to them because you know what they are, you know, for who they are, what they did. It says the Lord is good to everyone, and he showers compassion on all his creation. And I just want to demonstrate showers, okay? Okay, just make sure you understood. And, you know, I couldn't find it. We used to have a super soaker, and I could reach the back of the church with that one, even the balcony sometimes. I apologize, guys. 
you're, you're kind of out of the, the, the showers of God's blessings this morning, okay? But I want you to remember what showers are. And sometimes we take the showers of God's blessings and his goodness for granted. The grass that, that grows and the trees and the flowers and the air we have to breathe. And there's a million things. How many of you enjoyed the sunrise this morning? What's this? Well, some of you did because I sent you a picture of it, you know. But, you know, we take that for granted. There's people say, the sun rises in the morning, you know. I've seen a sunset a couple of times, but I haven't seen it. That's a blessing. And just so you know, the, every sunrise, and it's a living picture. You know, it's always changing. You know, it's, it's living and it's moving and all. And all of the sunrises God has made for me personally. You may enjoy them if you like, but they're mine, just so you know that, okay? Uh, And it's wonderful to spend time with him in the morning, you know, to walk with him, because God's got a lot to say, and he is awesome, and he is wonderful, and he'll give you the inside news, the info, you know. He'll he'll give you the wisdom to handle what goes on in a day's time. He really will if we'll just hang out with him and spend a little bit of time with him and learn how to hear his voice and learn how to communicate with him. Let me see here. Where was I at now? Verse 7, I think. No? Was it 7? Oh, it's about, oh, it about showers. Okay. Did I get you, dear? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, guys. Did I get you all too? Okay, I'll make up for it. All right? All right. Okay. All right. All right. Huh? Oh, no, I think it's almost out of water, you know? Okay, anyhow, it is fantastic when we experience the showers of his goodness and the showers of his compassion, as he says here in his word, you know, on all his creation. On all his creation, he showers his goodness and his compassion on us all. And verse 10 says, all of your works, all of your works will thank you, Lord, and your faithful followers will bless you. Well, that's me, and that's many of you who is a faithful follower, and you're blessing God, you're praising him, you're thanking him for all the things that he has done. And then he goes on in verse 11, he says, they will talk together about the glory of your kingdom. Uh, The faithful ones, you're going to talk about all that God's got going on, you know, the glory of your kingdom. They will celebrate... Talk, celebrate examples of your power. They will tell about your mighty deeds. It just goes on and on about, you know, we're going to talk and we're going to proclaim and we're going to declare, we're going to celebrate. He says, they'll tell about your mighty deeds and about the majesty and glory of your reign. Verse 13 says, for your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. You rule generation after generation. The Lord is faithful In all he says, everything he said, he's faithful to it. He's true to it. He doesn't lie. He says here, for the Lord is faithful in all he says. He is gracious in all he does. Faithful in all he says. He's gracious. God's enabling power in all that he does. He loves you. He's crazy about you. You will never, ever, ever experience God in heaven picking up a big old stick and ready to clobber you with it. That's not God. If that picture ever pops in your mind, I can tell you the devil is the one who put it there to try to thank you, to try to make you think that God's mad at you. Because he's not. He may be disappointed in our choices, but he is so quick to forgive us if we'll acknowledge our need. He wants to forgive us. He wants us to move forward. He wants us to move ahead. He goes on to say here in uh, verse 14, The Lord helps the fallen, and he lifts up those bent beneath their loads. Hmm. You you, you ever feel a load on you? You know, a heavy load? Now, when I hike up on the mountain, I have a lot of different methods of walking sticks that I use. But here's a a set. Susan and I both have a set of these. And uh, what it does, you would say, those are ski poles. We know what ski poles look like. And when I first saw these years ago, I felt the same thing. And I actually used a pair of ski poles to hike with. And it's just like, this looks funny, you know. 
you know, in the middle of the summer, you've got ski poles going up on the mountain and all. But you know what happens with poles like this? If you're hiking on a place where there's a lot of loose rock and stuff like that, you become more like a deer, where you can slip and slide. But here, you, 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 you anchor down. If you're hiking on a mountain that's going like this, you can adjust the height on these and have a short one here, and, 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 and they're at the same level in your hand. Or if you're going up, you can shorten them both as you're going up and all. But as you're hiking around, if you're just two legs, you can fall. But with another two set of legs in front of you, you are much more safe. And I take Susan up on the mountain, and she's a little bit... <laughs> exactly. But she feels much more secure with the, the sticks because the, the walking sticks, because going up and down, you can't hit all these rolling rocks. Now they're hidden under leaves and things like that. And this just gives you a lot more security. So I, I used to use just one walking stick, you know, that I use all the time. And then I converted, well, the Bible says two is better than one, right? So I use two walking sticks, but I found out something that's even better, you know, when we're dealing with, you know, loads and, and stability and all, in all manner of life, and that's God. God stabilizes us, and he helps us in all the things that we have to deal with in our life. And it says, the Lord helps the fallen, and he lifts us, he lifts up those bent beneath their loads. You know, he'll take hold of, of you and me, you know, so we can lean on him. No matter what's going on in our life, we can lean on him. And you remember what Jesus said in the book of Matthew? He said, come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. And then he says, take my yoke upon you. You picture like two oxen. You got an old ox and a young ox, and that's how they teach the young ox how to, to plow and when to eat and when to, to get a, something to drink and all, and the big ox is really doing most of the work, but Jesus says, come to me, take my yoke upon you. You know, we're going to walk together. You're going to learn from me. And, and I am telling you, God wants you to have time with him because when you're walking together, you talk. And I am telling you that God wants to reveal certain things to all of our lives if we just make time in a, a non-destructive place where we can hear what he's saying to us and learn how to recognize his voice and learn how to communicate with him. And he will sustain us and we can lean upon him no matter what's going on in our lives. In the book of Genesis chapter 6 verse 9, and this is in the NIV, it says Noah, what did Noah build? This awesome boat, right? Ark. Noah was a righteous man. He, he was right with God. Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time, and he walked with God. Hmm. And when you walk with someone, you talk to them. And Noah, he walked with God. God gave him specific details and instructions about how to build this ark, how long the, the boards were to be, the, all the dimensions, what kind of wood to use, how to, uh, you know, caulk the, the little gaps between the board to make it waterproof, how to get all the animals aboard, and also how to invite everybody else on the planet into this massive ship, you know, about the size of an aircraft carrier or something like that. It was huge. It was, it was amazing. But it says here, and it says in Noah, he walked with God. And that walk is what we would call the walk of faith. The, the walk of faith, of putting our trust in the Almighty, is, is believing Him and, and trusting Him every step of the way. And Noah was a true hero of faith because he walked in faith, because he walked with God. And then let me read it to you out of the New Living Translation. And it says, He, talking about Noah, consistently, consistently means Time after time, again and again, over and over, constantly, every time, without fail, always, he consistently followed God's will. He consistently followed God's will, and he had a relationship, and it says, and he, what's the next word? He enjoyed. Some people think this is an enduring. Oh, you got to endure 
being around God because you just don't never know when he might zap you or something or another. That's a, that's a lie from the pits of hell. He says, you know, he consistently followed God's will and he enjoyed a close relationship with him. Noah enjoyed a close relationship with God. And I don't know if you know this or not, but you can. Every one of us, it doesn't matter your background, doesn't matter your education, it don't matter about any of that. Every one of us can enjoy a close relationship with God. He loves, he created you. He knows everything about you. And he knows how to get your attention and speak to you and lead you and guide you. He knows all that. Oh, he enjoyed not endured, but he enjoyed a close relationship with God. Psalms 37, verse 23 says, the steps of the godly. Question, are you godly? The word godly means godlike. Like the word Christian means Christ-like. And so if he transforms us and he brings about an awesome change in us. But it says the steps are, of the godly are directed... By the Lord. So, so let's choose that right now, you know, to follow his directions. The steps of the godly, you know, are directed by the Lord. So we can walk close with him on a day-by-day, -day, uh, you know, relationship. And you can start in the morning or in the evening, you know, whenever. But the fact that we, we walk with him and a good place to start is five-minute walk. Where if it might be a five-minute walk with God can lead when you see what, what God tells you and how he helps you and how he inspires you and your faith rises. It's like, you know, five minutes ain't enough. I want to hang out for 10 minutes or 20 or 30 or 40 or an hour or two. It's just like this is not wasting time. This is actually getting hold of God's will for our life, for our children, for our future, for our health, for our finances, for, for whatever's going on in our life. I'm talking about hanging out with God who, who created you and who, who loves you. Uh, listen to this, uh, this passage again. It says in Psalms 37, 23, the steps of the godly are directed by the Lord. He does what? He delights. He delights. That means it's a pleasure to him. He delights in every detail of their lives. Did you know that God delights? You, you know, when, when you see someone get married and, you know, the bride and her mom and grandmoms or aunts and, and all their bridal party, the girls, and, and they're, they're just so involved in, you know, the details of a wedding or, and some little girls are planning their wedding from little on up and, and moms and all are so involved in all the little details. You know how you can get involved in all the details of your children's lives? Uh, you know, whether they're getting married or something else going on, their hobbies or their, their birthdays or Christmas. It says here that God delights in every detail of their lives. We may be getting get busy and preoccupied and miss something special. But God don't. It says he takes pleasure in every detail of your life. Whatever you're going through, he takes pleasure in all the little details because he's crazy about you. I mean, that's amazing. Why wouldn't I want to take a walk with him who delights in every little detail of my life? He wants me to enjoy life here on this planet, you know? He does things for me that he don't do for you, you know? He gives me all these awesome sunrises, you know what I'm saying? Y'all are welcome to use them, as I already told you, you know. And there may be things that he does for you that he don't do for me, you know. But he knows you. He knows everything about us, and he delights in the details. The details. He never intended you to be miserable through life. He says, the devil comes to kill, soon and destroy, comma, Jesus came to give life in all of its fullness. And all the details that relate to you. He's crazy about you. He really genuinely is. So he sure was involved with the details with, with Noah, giving him little itsy bitsy details of how to build and how to get the animals on board and all the things that was going on there. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 it says, So you see it is impossible to please God without faith. You know, we walk with God by faith. And so it says, you see, it's impossible to please God without faith. And anyone who wants to come to him 
anybody who wants to come close and walk with him must believe that there is a God and that he rewards those who sincerely seek him, seek him from the bottom of their heart. And some people have told me, like, well, God don't want you to you know, do things just because you're going to be rewarded or blessed by it. Well, he sure tells us about it a whole lot. He says in his word, he says, he rewards those who sincerely seek him. He's not hiding the fact that he rewards us. And he knows about every detail and he delights in every detail. I mean, you know, all the little things that you like, he cares about those things because he cares about you. And he don't mind you to know that he's going to bless you with this. Just like a a kid might know, you know, I'd ask mommy for something for my birthday and I hope she gets it, you know. God has no limitations, and he's crazy about you and your family. He really is. Anyhow, he says here in verse 7, it was by faith that Noah built an ark. He took action. You know, God spoke something to him, and he, he allowed faith, but faith if our works is dead. He went into action. And he obeyed God. It was by faith. Noah, that's who we're reading about in the Old Testament. This is the New Testament. It was by faith that Noah built an ark to save his family from the flood. What he did walking with God impacted his family and gave us one of the most wonderful object lessons of the gospel ever given. You, you think about it. Here God says he was going to send judgment on the world because man was becoming more wicked day by day by day. He was going to send a flood. His judgment was coming. And because he, he had a relationship, with Noah, he said, I want you to build this ark. And I want to tell you how to do it. It took him about 100 years to do it. He said, I want you to invite everybody, every human being, you invite them. This is, this is an awesome in size. It would accommodate everybody who was in, in those areas there. He invited them. But they'd come up there on the weekends and just laugh at this old man building this ark, building this boat when they'd never seen anything like he was predicting would happen. And he was inviting them. He said, when the flood comes, you'll need this. And they laughed and they chuckled and they made fun of him for years and years and years and years. That's that's exactly what happened. But then when the flood came, the flood did come. And the water began to burst forth from the ocean depths, these springs and that rain from the heavens and the water rose. And imagine all the lions and tigers and bears left on the earth They're seeking the high ground along with the people are seeking the high ground. It's becoming a ferocious fight, you know, to live. And they finally got there to the ark, and you could have seen fingernails that humans had ripped off of their hand trying to open the door. Noah couldn't open it. The Bible says that God closed the door on the ark at the right time so the floodwaters wouldn't get in. And all the people who have been laughing and making fun of Noah and his family for building this big old boat up there, they weren't laughing no more. And, and Noah's heart was breaking because he wanted to rescue them. And the ark is a type of Christ. When we're in a relationship with Christ, the judgment that will come one day upon this earth, and you read about it in the book of Revelation, the judgment and the difficult times that have come, you know, in our relationship with Christ, we will be lifted up above that. There's something that's called the rapture you know, of those who still remain when that judgment comes. In a relationship with Christ, we'll be lifted up above that, and that will not affect, his judgment will not affect you as it does those who have rejected Almighty God. Anyhow, he says right here um, in verse 7, it was by faith that Noah built an ark to save his family from the flood. He obeyed God because he was walking with God. He obeyed God who warned him about something that had never happened before. Ah, oh, well, you know, I ain't never seen nothing like that before. It surely couldn't happen. There's all kinds of things that happen in this day and time that never happened before. Isn't that true? You go back a f- few years and could you talk to someone around the world and see their, a, 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 a picture of them talking to you at the same time? That never happened before. Well, it happens now. And whatever God has said in his word, it happens. It will happen absolutely for sure. Anyhow, in 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 27, it says, How the mighty heroes have fallen. Now, Noah had did a little stumbling and, and some falling his own self as time progressed. Christian leaders, have you ever heard 
read in the paper or watched on the news or something, some Christian leader who has fallen. That kind of stuff happens sometimes. You know, it even talks about in, in the Bible, it talks about Saul and Jonathan and Noah and David and Jonah and Peter and the list just goes on and on and us. And what about you? Have you ever fallen? We've all fallen. We have. Uh, is there anyone who has never fallen? Well, I used to say that all the time. But on a physical level, not sinful, but on a physical level, even Jesus had fallen. After he'd been beaten horribly, and he was forced to carry his cross up to the top of the Golgotha, the mountain, to be crucified under the weight of the cross, what happened? He fell, and someone came alongside, picked up his cross, and carried it the rest of the way. And Jesus was nailed to it, and he suffered the crucifixion, and then he gave up his life. And then the Bible tells us three days after he had given up his life, the Holy Spirit came and raised him up from the dead. Raised him up, and he has been alive ever since. But he had fallen in a physical way. But all of us have fallen in some spiritual ways if we think about it. You know, and, and there's a big difference between falling down and staying down. And there's a big difference between getting knocked down and getting knocked out. There's a big difference between it. Listen to what it says in Romans 3.23. It says, for all, talking about all of mankind, everybody on the planet, except Jesus here, for all have sinned, you know, and all, what's that say? And all fall short because of Adam and Eve's sin. And we need to understand Eve was deceived. She was deceived by the devil. She genuinely was. Adam was not deceived. That makes it even worse, you know, because he willfully, he knew it was wrong and, and did it anyhow, you know. So we're not picking on either gender here. We're just acknowledging what the Bible says. We've all fall. We've all fallen. That's what the scripture tells us, you know. We've fallen from a close relationship with God, but it can be regained. Relationship with God, even if we've fallen, can be, you know, regained and it can be maintained. Tained. Um, after reading this story about Adam and Eve, uh, this lady read the story about Adam and Eve to her daughter who was four years old and to her son who was five. And then she asked her, her uh, daughter and her son, she said, what was the story trying to tell us about? And without hesitation, five-year-old little guy stands up and he said, do not play with snakes. The snake tempted Eve, and then she tempted Adam, and don't play with snakes. That's pretty good advice, don't you think? Do not play with snakes, you know. And the serpent was the, the cause of Eve to give in and take a bite of that apple. He came, you know, as a snake, you know. And uh, anyone here ever fallen? Just physically, you know? Okay, well, if you haven't, you may still have opportunity, yeah, you know. <laughs> now, I have probably told most of you this already, but last year, uh, it was a little bit later in the year, more in the winter time, and uh, we'd had a little bit of snow, and the snow had melted for the most part during the day, turned to water and was going down our driveway. Our driveway's kind of steep, and so this water was trickling down, you know, this little path down the driveway, and during the night, it got cold again, a little precipitation came down, it was a walloping, not even a half an inch. It's probably a quarter inch of snow. Covered the grass, covered the whole driveway and everything. So I'm going down there to the mailbox, down to the steeple hill there and all. And, and, and why do people trip and fall? It's because there's something usually that they can't see. Okay? And you trip and you slip because of something you can't see. And our whole driveway and our yard was covered with snow, less than a half an inch, but it was all white. So I'm walking down the driveway, going down there to get the mail and all, and I slipped, tripped. Anyhow, I didn't fall down. I fell up. 
You understand falling up? You slip so hard and so quick, your feet come up about head high. And then your body goes down at one time. You know, and I, I had this same knife I have in my pocket right now. I have this knife in my pocket. It wasn't open, of course, but it's a big old chunky knife. And when I, I slipped, because I couldn't see what was under that snow, and I hit it, my feet came up, and then I went down, and the first thing that hit the asphalt was my knife in that pocket. And my hip is still sore to this day, a year later. Yes, because of something I couldn't see. And the devil's always trying to chip us up or to make us slip, don't you think? I'm going to tell you, if, when we learn to walk with God, God will give us the wisdom and the insight and direction. He'll help us and, and he'll protect us. He, he tells us and he promises this all through his word, you know. Anyhow, what benefits us the most and personally, what benefits my family the most? What benefits and honors God and his kingdom the most after a person falls? Get up! If, if I didn't get up, if I'd have stayed there a couple of days, I would have died of hypothermia in just a few hours. It would sap the heat right out of your body, you know. So the thing that honors my family and me and God is to get up. Now, the devil would be delighted if I fall down to stay there so he can advance his kingdom and take us out of the picture of talking to people about Jesus, you know. I looked upon a farm one day that once I used to own. The barn had fallen to the ground. The fields were overgrown. The house in which my children grew where we had lived for years. I turned to see it broken down, and I brushed aside the tears. I looked upon my soul one day to find it too had grown, with thorns and nettles everywhere, the seeds that neglect had sown. The years had passed while I had cared for things of lesser worth. The things of heaven I let go when minding things of earth. To Christ I turned with bitter tears and, and cried, Oh, Lord, forgive. I haven't much time left for thee. Not many years to live. The wasted years forever gone. The days I, I can't recall. If I could live those days again. If I could live those days again. If I could live those days again. I'd make him Lord of all. And that's what we should do today before we leave fear. And the, the word Lord, you know, people say, well, Jesus is my Savior and Lord. Savior means one thing. Lord means another. The word Lord means the one who is, absolute, who is in absolute control of every area of my life. And there's a lot of people who have received the forgiveness of God, but they have not surrendered everything to God. And we're getting ready to end the previous decade. We're getting ready to launch out into a brand new decade. And what are we going to do for our life, you know? How are we going to invest our life for the, the decade that is ahead of us? Here's a passage that uh, a dear friend of mine, we would talk about it every time we got together. And many of you know this friend. He died in his mid-90s. Anybody remember Bill Adams? Bill Adams was a figure around here you know, for a long time. He's with Jesus now. You know, and Bill Adams, the, the most disappointing thing that Bill would ever talk about was it's like he didn't come to know Jesus until he was way up in his 60s. And he wished he had known him when he was a young man. But from those 60s, he was faithful to him. But he loved this passage. I'm getting ready to read you. It's in Joel. And it says, And I will restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten, and the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm. And he clinged to that passage. He said, God promises to restore all the years that I had misspent. God's going to restore those years. Almost like getting a spiritual bulldozer and plowing the path to get me where I should have been, you know. But God restores. Even if we've fallen, if, if we've spent our life improper. And I want to challenge each and every one of you. Maybe you've fallen. 
And I'm going to tell you, God will never condemn you. He will challenge you. What that little girl said, that little girl just simply said, get up. And he challenges us to get up and to, to, he says, walk with me. Walk in a close relationship. Jesus went to the cross for one reason, and that's to forgive you of your sins and to give you another chance to get up and walk with him. And I believe with all my heart that God has special things planned for each of us in this room. He does, and, and we can miss it totally, just kind of exist through life or walk close to God and, and learn to talk with him and learn to hear his voice and his word and find out what God has created you for and, and what he wants you to do and how you can make a difference with your life. I believe we're in the latter days. I don't know how many days we have. I don't know. But I do believe we're in the last days. And we want to invest our, our time, our energy, our resources in this next decade in a way that honors God. And it makes a difference in other people's lives for eternity. You know, there, there, there's so much he has in store for us. And he wants a close, intimate relationship. Well, you know what? I got so much, and there's some things I told people last night. I didn't tell the groups today. I just kept running out of time. So I'm going to share one more verse with you, and then we'll be done until next week, and we'll finish this, okay? It says in Psalms 143, verse 8, it says, Let me hear of your unfailing love to me in the morning. Now, it's the best time to, to walk with God, to have time to hang out with God is to start your day. Instead of at the end of the day going, oh my God, I sure wish you'd have been with me through the day. We start off like, Lord, I invite you to lead me and guide me through the day. It's really the best time. But you can hang out with God, whatever works for your schedule. And you may not have a mountain to walk around on. You can walk in your yard or, or, or you can walk in your bathroom, if that's you know, what's available to you. Or, or you can sit and park your car in the driveway and watch the sunrise. Or it don't matter as long as there's somewhere where you feel is private enough to hang out with God for at least five minutes. And that five minutes will probably grow when God begins to speak to you and, and help you and encourage you and build your faith and change things in your life for the better and for, for, for your whole family, you'll go, wow, how did I miss this? But listen to what the scripture says. Let me hear of your unfailing love to me in the morning, for I am trusting you. Show me where to walk. Show me where to walk. For I have come to you, how? In prayer. And prayer is the key to walking with God. Because when you walk with him, you'll talk with him, and he'll speak to us. And the more the word you have in your heart, he'll bring those things alive. Even if you're not looking in a, a Bible, but when you read it, it's like, whoa, that just jumped off the page at me. And his word changes, it builds faith, and it transforms us. And God is looking to reveal himself to men and women, even the youth. He's looking to reveal himself to us so our lives can be profitable. We can do what we were created to do, what we were created for, and reach our full potential and make a difference in this world with our lives. I'm telling you, God's crazy about you. He loves you, and he will reveal himself to you if you give him an opportunity to do so. I know what God has been speaking to me about our future as a church and how we can reach more people than ever before. And it's going to be simpler than it ever has been before. I know that. And I can see that very clearly. And we just got to keep getting instructions from him and his empowering and, and his love that motivates us to be all that we can be for him. There's so much God has in store for every man, woman, boy, and girl who will just make some time just to be alone with God. Start with five minutes. Anybody can start with five minutes and see what God does, how he reveals himself to you in the midst of that. Um, there's so much I, I want to say, but I just can't get to it right now. But remember, he delights in every little detail of your life. Your smallest problem he's interested in, he's concerned about. What makes you cry? 
He's interested. He's concerned about what makes you laugh. He's interested in. He delights in every detail of your life. I'm telling you, God loves you. He's crazy about you. And you will never make a wrong decision when you choose to serve God. And don't listen to the, the devil no more when he says, Ah, God can't use you because of. You hear the voice of God that was speaking through that little girl there. Get up. Get up. God forgives us and cleanses us from every wrong. Get up. And let's surrender our past, our present, and our future to him. Let's bow our heads together. Father, we come before you in the name of your son, Jesus, the name above every other name. And Lord, we ask if you would speak to us all, not just in this building, but those who are watching online, that Father, you'd touch their hearts and you would inspire them to get up, never again to let the devil pull them down with their past, but to give us all the assurance of forgiveness and help us all to get up. Empower us to get up and to give you the rest of our lives to do whatever you want to do with it, Lord. We know it will fulfill us and satisfy us and it will make a difference in this world in which we live. As our heads are bowed, I would ask you if you would just join me as we pray and just surrender our past, our present, and our future to him. And if you don't know him already, welcome him as Savior of your life. Would you pray with me right now? Those who are in this room, and those who are watching online as well, would you join me? Dear Heavenly Father, I believe that you love me. And you care about every detail of my life. That's why you sent your son Jesus. He gave his life to wash all my sins away. And Jesus rose from the dead and is knocking at the door of my heart. I hear the knock, and I open that door wide. And I welcome Jesus as my Savior and as my Lord. I totally surrender to you. Your will be done. In Jesus' name. And Lord, I ask your blessings upon whoever that is traveling by right now who is heading to an emergency somehow. Help them, Father. Somebody may be in need who we know, but we ask that you would draw that driver and that person who is in need unto you, that they would come to know you as their Savior and their Lord as well. Thank you, Lord, for being there for us and helping us when we need it. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.